Will Davies, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, so your book is called The Happiness Industry, How Big Business and Government Sold Us Well-Being. And the reason why I want to have you on the show to talk about this book, because it takes on a topic that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and it's this idea everywhere you go, blog posts, magazine articles, news shows about, it's all about how to be happy, how to increase your well-being. And it's kind of, I'm, I'm sort of drawn to it at, at one hand, but at the other time, I'm, at the other hand, I'm sort of repulsed by it. Um, that I'm told that you need to be happy. Uh, I don't know. I guess the rebel in me, rebel in me doesn't like that. Uh, in your book, you sort of take on and uh, uh, critique what you, what you call the happiness industry. Before we get into why being happy might not be such a great thing, or what, rephrase that, uh, having businesses being so interested in us being happy is uh, not such a great thing. Can you explain what you mean by the happiness industry? Sure. And I have similar feelings about this as you do in that I think a, a society or a workplace that cares about our feelings is clearly a good thing. You don't want to live in a society that is indifferent to people's feelings. You don't want to be surrounded by managers or, or businesses that don't care about their impact on, on people's minds and their feelings and so on. But I was drawn to this topic in a similar way in that it struck me that some on the face of it what were quite noble um, ethical impulses and agendas seem to be co-opted in certain ways by marketing by um, uh, management by certain certain areas of government policy and I think what's key here is the role of measurement and the role of economics and particularly in the last 20 years I would say uh, the happiness and emotions have become a very hot topic in economics, uh, in neuroscience, particularly at the moment in a, to a growing extent in areas of computer science and what's called affective computing, which develops various techniques for trying to read the emotions of people via the movements of their faces or their eyes or the, the, the behavior of their brains and whatever it might be. And what's happened as a result of these advances in particular areas of um, you know, social science and behavioral science and, and medical science is that certain interests in society, particularly those of corporations, but also um, those who are trying to come up with more efficient ways of delivering public services or health services or whatever it might be, or ways of trying to uh, discipline certain areas of the population, have used this body of knowledge and seen it as an opportunity to uh, either make money or to cut costs or to try and uh, change the way people behave. So I think it's particularly that uh, co-option or that, um, excuse the sociological language, but that instrumentalization of um, ethical and, and political and cultural ideals uh, in pursuit of uh, rather more cynical agendas that I would term the happiness industry. Okay, so this this includes uh, things like wearable tech, uh, Fitbits, um, yeah, and I guess there's even now there's technology. I have a few pieces of this technology where you know you, you can put a band around your head, and it can read brain waves and tell you if you are focused or if you are calm. Um, yeah, what are some and other tech can actually try to influence your feelings that way as well? Yeah, I just saw that just came out. I just I've been seeing ads for this thing. It's a device you you stick to the side of your head. And it can make you feel energized or calm, right? You know, I guess they, I guess they use electricity to do that. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand the technology. There's one called Numitra, I think, which does something like that. Yeah, and I guess uh, you're seeing more corporations uh, include things like mindfulness training, like they're encouraging their employees to meditate. Uh, there's nap rooms now. A lot of businesses yeah. have mat nap rooms. So you know, on the face, it seems like, well, that's great. You know, that the, the businesses are doing this. Um, but you make the case in your book that, in a in a strange way, they've actually created this problem. Like they're doing this to to make us more productive. It's not just to be be nice. Like they want to get more out of us. Yes, I think businesses have been interested in in feelings and happiness for a long time. I mean, one of the things that I try to do in the book is to not just tell the the more recent story, which I, I, I outlined very briefly just now, but to also put this in the in the longer context. Businesses have been interested in psychology and um, emotions since at least the 1920s. And in the workplace, with the rise of the what we now call human resources, um, there has been 
concern to try and talk to employees in the right way and so on and to make sure they feel good about themselves. It's got quite a long history because it's known that this has an impact on their productivity. I think what, one of the things that the happiness science of the last 20 or 25 years has changed is that people can now put dollar signs on that extra productivity or, or on those on those emotions. Um, so some of the happiness economists have calculated that a happy employee is 12% more productive than an unhappy employee. I mean, these, these kind of calculations vary. Um, the opinion polling company Gallup does all of this research on what they call employee engagement, um, which suggests that less than a third of the uh, workforce in uh, countries like the United States are fully psychologically engaged in their work and that this is costing hundreds of billions of dollars a year uh, to the US economy. And I don't question the uh, evidence as such. Uh, what I, I think one of the dangers with this type of evidence is that it does create rather a cynical approach which doesn't try to, which, which looks to, in a sense, change the symptom rather than look at the cause. So if it is true that employees are stressed or unhappy or disengaged, one of the problems with trying to put dollar signs on those problems is that immediately people get drawn to just trying to deal with the, the symptom. They just try to say, well, how can we kind of just sort of, you know, re-energize people? You know, what do we need to do? Do we need to give them free lunch? Uh, do we need to give them uh, free gym membership? Do we need to kind of track their behavior using a, a wearable? Uh, or do we just kind of, I mean, one of the stories I heard when I was um, talking about the book in Philadelphia a couple of months ago was someone in the audience told me that um, he worked in a casino there where uh, employees were required to dance to Pharrell Williams's Happy uh, with the manager once a week in an effort <laughs> to try and, you know, start the week with a kind of, you know, pep everybody up and get them going. Uh, now, this kind of thing clearly is going to yield its own uh, negative forms of, uh, of cynicism, of further psychological disengagement. Um, human beings are not lab rats. They can't just have their, their, their psychology or their behavior tweaked purely by some kind of, you know, slight tweaking of the environment. I think that the question of how to produce fulfilling work is a, is a serious one, but that also requires businesses and managers to engage in some, some rather more complicated questions about the extent to which people are able to kind of fit work around the rest of their lives or the extent to which people can um, have genuine time off or, or or the extent to which people have a say in how they go about their work. Um, the sorts of areas where a lot of this happiness science is being put to work are in areas like call centers, which are quite stressful, um, high surveillance environments where labor turnover is incredibly high because it's not enjoyable work. Um, and the managers turn to the happiness science to try and find out how they can deal with these problems simply to try and sort of change the change the symptom, change the way in which people's emotions are, are being are churning around in the workplace rather than to actually question uh, the nature of the work itself. Yeah, that was a, a, an inter interesting point because I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of the resilient, you know, being resilient, like resilience training, uh, learning how to uh, remain calm even when things are going uh, crazy around you. But at the same time, I, I always had that question for folks whenever I've talked to people who uh, are experts in resilience or whatever, uh, and say, well, how do, how do you make things better, right? This just like puts a Band-Aid on the problem, right? How do I, how do I answer, the, how do I solve the problem where I don't have to be resilient anymore for that particular thing? Um, and I, I feel like the whole idea of just being mindful and being resilient, it sort of uh, puts the question of how to solve these problems to the side and just uh, just deal with it. We can't solve it. It's too big. Just be resilient. You'll be okay. Yeah. I mean, I, certainly I think these types of responses, particularly amongst public policymakers, these types of responses arise partly as a result of the powerlessness of, of policymakers more generally and that they it's harder to tackle um, stress, uh, tackle uh, insecurity, uh, this cause, the sources of anxiety and depression, which it's clear from uh, certain areas of social science, areas such as social epidemiology and these kinds of um, uh, research areas, that things like depression and anxiety are triggered by things in the environment to, to, to a large extent. Of course, they also have neurological and biological dimensions to them, um, but they uh, don't just arise out of nowhere. And it's no coincidence that they uh, are much higher in, uh, the rates are much higher in, in societies such as the United States or in Britain than they are in, um, for instance, in, in lots of Northern European um, nations. 
Um, and I think that in a way, the the resort to saying, well, in that case, we need to somehow teach individuals to be more resilient or more mindful or, or, to, or to look after their mental health better is partly um, a symptom of, the, of, of political powerlessness in a way to actually challenge some of the forces for uh, insecurity, inequality, high levels of materialism and competitiveness, which are known to uh, correlate closely to uh, levels of, of, of things like depression. Um, and I mean, you see this in, in the school system. I mean, in, in, in Britain, where I live, um, there's a great movement to try and teach more techniques such as happiness and resilience and, and so on in school and to introduce mindfulness into classrooms and so on. Um, but if you look elsewhere in the education system, the teachers suffer terrible levels of stress because they're all uh, constantly being monitored and audited by the government. Pupils are all suffering terrible levels of anxiety and stress because they're constantly tested the whole time. They never have any time off from between testing. You know, as soon as they come back from the summer holidays, there's a test within a couple of weeks. Um, so you have all of these kind of stress factors, but no one questions the stress factors. All they do is say, well, in that case, we need to have more uh, resilience training to make sure that individuals can cope with this kind of thing. But I think that at a certain point, you can't just allow um, mental health problems to get worse and worse, particularly amongst children and young people, uh, without beginning to also question some of the, the, the cultural and institutional factors that, that uh, trigger that. So you, uh, you said, you mentioned just a, bit, a little bit ago that uh, this uh, desire of businesses, uh, governments to be concerned about the, the well-being, the mental well-being of their employees or their citizens uh, isn't new and it goes way back uh, and you make the case that the seeds of all this uh, you know, techno mindful utopia uh, that we have today were sa were sown by the founder of utilitarianism um, Jeremy Bentham um, for listeners who aren't familiar with utilitarianism can you explain what that is and and how is it that utilitarianism led to you know mon Fitbits and mood trackers and things like that <laughs> yeah so obviously there's a, there's a lot in between but yeah uh, <laughs> um, Jeremy Bentham was a, a an English philosopher, but he was actually a lawyer originally who was born in the um, uh, late eighteenth century he worked his work he worked between the, the late eighteenth century and the and, and the uh, he died i think in the eighteen thirties um, and he was a product of the enlightenment and he looked at things like the law and looked at politics and looked at the activities of the government, also looked at the French revolutionaries and the American revolutionaries. And he thought the whole, all of it across, whether it was tr conservatives or radicals, that they were all di distracted and deluded by um, abstract philosophical ideas like justice or, um, or, or, or theological ideas like the divine right of kings or um, revolutionaries talking about like innate human rights and this sort of thing, people like Thomas Paine. Um, and he thought that it was all basically nonsense. And he thought the only way to put politics and law on scientific foundations was to learn from the, uh, what was going on in the natural sciences at the same time, in chemistry and physics and elsewhere, which he thought looked rational and coherent in a way that what was going on in the political realm and philosophy and law was 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 kind of fueled by this nonsensical use of language and he argued that um we need to turn to what what is the underlying physical um uh, underpinnings of our of our ethical uh, intuitions of our ethical of our ethical principles and he said that the only thing that you can really found ethics on or politics on or, or any notion of justice on is the fact that all human beings have have an innate natural tendency to pursue pleasure and avoid pain and he meant this in quite a physical sense he didn't mean it in just a sort of abstract or philosophical sense he, he meant it in the sense that we are animals that are driven to to maximize our own pleasure and, and to avoid pain and on, on top of this natural theory about humans he constructed a theory of 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 utilitarianism, which suggested that the only way in which governments could run society in any scientific sense would be to construct things in a way that as much pleasure was distributed as possible, which amounted to what we call happiness, uh, and uh, as little pain was generated as possible. But governments could also do things like deliberately uh, intervene with forms of pain. Uh, that, uh, 
that is punishment to to change the way people behave so that you would you know you think of something like a speed camera or something you you know you you want people to um slow down in their car so you 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 create certain sort of carefully calculated interventions to try and change the way people behave by 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 um uh, the threat of some kind of punishment so he thought that you could have a science of politics and he thought that um that it was this natural sense that we 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 are we are basically um, driven by our, our, our pleasures and our pains that he thought could be the foundation of that politics. Now, what, I, what I've argued in the book is that this belief that it's our bodies that really are at the, are at the heart of ethics and are at the heart of, of politics, um, and that likewise the, the, the political language and the philosophical language and moral language is a, is a dangerous distraction, these are kind of key ideas in Jeremy Bentham's work. And, and I argue in the book, that in a way, you can see this, this same uh, uh, bias, I suppose, at work in a lot of uh, Silicon Valley innovations today. So, you know, so we look at something like the, the Apple Watch or something like that, and the promise of these technologies is that instead of us having to rely on, on, on what we say we're doing or what we think we're doing or what we tell other people we're doing or tell other people we like or whatever, that what these things will do is to provide hard data about what our bodies uh, say is going on in our lives. So, you know, they will tell us how you're sleeping, how much you're walking, how much water you're drinking. They say that the next generation of Apple Watches or in a couple of generations' time, it will tell you things about your emotions and how you're feeling. Um, you can do forms of data mining on people's um, text messages or their, their Twitter use to to, to um, analyze what they're feeling in terms of what's called sentiment analysis. Um, so there's a similar prejudice as Jeremy Bentham had you know, over 200 years ago, which says, stop listening to what people tell you. Stop uh, dwelling in the what Bentham called the tyranny of sounds, people talking about, oh, you know, I, I like this, I like that, I, this is what I believe, these are my principles, and so on, and get towards this science of the body, science of choices, of behavior, of, of, of physical responses, and, uh, uh, and um, the physical symptoms of emotions, rather than um, the, the 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 linguistic world of, of of how people talk about things. Why is uh, why is listen why why is listening to the body not a good way to go to figure out what people really want? Right, like you know, neurotransmitters are released, neurons fire, hormones are released to a particular response. Um, I mean, what would be the counter to that? I mean, why why listen to someone they say yeah, I, I'm happy, but then they all their 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 body chemistry says well no. Sure. I mean, I, I suppose I, I think these things, this is partly about balance. I don't think sure. that you, none of this stuff is going to go away anytime soon. And I'm not suggesting that we should just sort of, you know, abandon this science altogether. But I think the problem is that a lot of the time it's, firstly, what it does, the first problem with it is that it uh, starts to bestow great powers upon the scientists in this situation and they're not necessarily scientists who work in universities with a, a kind of vocation to the broader public good or to, to knowledge or something they might be scientists working in <clears throat> private companies who are effectively you know working on, to pursue profit which is you know what com that, that that's the nature of these things is that uh, the um, companies that are collecting this data and analyzing this data are doing so on their own terms a lot of the time which doesn't mean that they don't deliver benefits to their users and their customers but but um, uh, there's a there's a, there's a kind of a, a concentration of power uh, in amongst all of this. I think the the one of the problems with this is um, with the way happiness science is going at the moment is that as companies, as, as, as technology developers, as, as scientists get more and more confident that they can actually see the symptoms the, of, of, of emotions or they, they can actually witness the emotion itself almost, whether that be via a neuroscan uh, or whether it be via various facial scanning technologies and so on, is what does that happen? What happens to our, our, our own accounts of what's going on? I mean, do they, do, do, do they still matter? Um, I mean, if, for instance, it's possible to um, f to monitor how an entire audience is, is reacting to a, uh, say, a, a concert or something, which it now is. I mean, this is now done. I mean, one of the examples in the book I, I give is of, of, at uh, uh, the at Literary Festival in Britain a couple of years ago, um, this smile harvesting technology was set up around the, the site to try and kind of collect data on how people were feeling from one moment to the next and so on. So this kind of thing is already going on. Now, does that mean that we don't need critics any longer or does that mean that we don't... Um, kind of discuss things in newspapers or or um in in other in other ways to try and 
just analyze what we think is think about it and what, what happens to human language uh, and human human discourse in amongst all of this um now i'm not saying that, it, that, that that we're necessarily silenced but i think that sometimes what people say they think about something or the reasons they give for their feelings need to be taken very seriously particularly where there's some kind of injustice involved so so sometimes people are not simply just unhappy um, or, or suffering a lack of pleasure in the way that Bentham might have recognised, but they actually have a serious grievance that they don't um, that they they want to articulate, they want to be heard, and they want um, uh, they they want to hang on to that grievance until it's until it's alleviated in some way. Um, if someone feels that there's an injustice in their society, to try and reframe that in terms of some kind of neural event or some kind of displeasure is a gross misunderstanding of of, of what that of how that person understands themselves and understands their lives. And I think that it's that kind of depoliticizing effect of the sort of Silicon Valley um, uh, view of the world or the Benthamite view of the world that, that troubles me because we need to grant people the, 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 the power and the authority to carry on saying, no, this is what I think, this is how I feel, this is, this is what I think needs to change in order for me to, to change my response to it, rather than to allow all of those things to become uh, in the hands of, of certain experts or those who have the best technology to, to monitor our feelings. Yeah, you made an interesting point in the book how you're seeing more and more, it, it seems like with this whole emphasis on big big data, um, it is in, in a lot of ways replacing morality. Um, like or it's moral philosophy, right? Um, because yeah. we can't agree on anything uh, in our uh, in our multicultural um, world, well, we'll just rely on this data to figure out yeah. what's good, what's bad. Yeah. Uh, and this is something which, in a way, that's what, that's also what Jeremy Bentham was effectively kind of hoping for. I mean, obviously, in the late 18th century, that was a hell of a long way off at the time. Um, but over the course of the 20th century, the, 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 the tools and the methodologies developed in the in psychology and in the behavioral sciences to, to realize or, or at least kind of start to um, push towards that, that kind of ideal. Um, but one of the interesting things is that there's been previous waves of this kind of exuberance. There was a, there was a wave of, of, of what, the, in a sense, the, the first era of behaviorism and, and behaviorism is, is a refers to the idea that it's possible to um, effectively to, um, to to manage people or govern people or to predict their behavior purely by observing them that if you can get enough data on on someone then you don't need to actually uh, kind of go and ask them necessarily ask them any questions or or try and understand them on their own terms you can simply kind of collect enough data and then they become um, uh, as predictable as, as anything in the natural world. So, um, and there was a the, the first wave of behaviorism, and I talk about this a bit in the book, was really between around about the time of the First World War and the 1930s, where you had a whole um, various psychologists. Um, you had the world's first management consultant, Frederick Taylor, and uh, huge excitement in the advertising industry that it was going to be possible to really get to the bottom of why people buy what they buy and that you wouldn't actually have to even give people, you know, make the products any good. You could just sort of kind of <laughs> manipulate people uh, purely by uh, getting the science right. Uh, now, of course, this is nonsense. And it was it, it kind of started to fall apart over the course of the 1930s. And actually, the what replaced it or what, what sort, of turned, sort of started to usurp it was rather more sensitive, more um, uh, socially conscious um, things like, well, there were things like the rise of opinion polling and uh, not long after that, things like focus groups, things which actually tried to sort of understand, get inside people's worlds a little bit more. Um, but then you had another wave of it in the 60s uh, with people at B.F. Skinner and, and, and famously Robert McNamara thought that the Vietnam War could be won purely in a, through the application of statistics and, and behavioral principles. Um, and then we're getting another wave now with big data. And all of this, in a way, it's this sort of recurring utopia, um, recurring idealism, uh, starts with Bentham, keeps recurring, that the way to live, we can, we, can, we can get around thorny dilemmas about how we should live our lives or how we should run our businesses or how we should sell our products, whatever it might be, purely by consulting the data. And I mean, if you read some of the big data uh, 
the more hysterical big data stuff at the moment. I mean, this is what people are, are saying, is they're saying, you know, the managers of the future won't have to you know the first thing about running a business. All they'll have to understand is 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 how to um, uh, feed questions into kind of, you know, data analytic, analytics. And all you need is going to have data scientists and uh, that all the answers will just come out of that. Well, I mean, the first problem with that is employees aren't, aren't, aren't going to be very happy working in companies where those running the companies effectively view them in this kind of like lab rats. Um, people, it matters to people whether or not their voices are heard or not. It matters to people whether their, um, their, their autonomy or their, their humanity really is respected. Um, and situations where people uh, are, are kind of reduced to, to data points don't tend to be very happy ones in the long run. So there's a kind of, a, I think, something kind of self-defeating about some of this stuff. Yeah. And another thing that troubles me about this whole happiness industry, and you, you talk about this in the book as well, is that there seems to be an encroachment of the market on aspects of our lives that you wouldn't think would have a dollar sign next to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so relationships, your friendships, your marriage, um, even spirituality, uh, these uh, businesses uh, and these researchers are trying to find ways that to optimize that, but not optimize it just for, for you know, because you want to have better friendship, but because better friendship can make you happier, which will in turn make you a more productive employee. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, it's important to try and disentangle the the, the good intentions from some of the the negative um, applications here, and I think that's always the the problem in this area sure. is that um, there are always there are always uh, there's always this kind of entanglement of, of good intentions and some rather more cynical um, uh, uses. Um, in terms of the intentions, well, in a way, a lot of the happiness science begins by trying to properly value non market. Good. So actually, one of the things that happiness scientists have been saying since the, the 1960s is actually, you know, we've got to stop we've got to stop putting dollar signs on everything. We've got to we've got to we've got to recognize that actually what masks people is things like spending time in their family, having some nice public spaces, having green spaces, having um, you know, the thing having time to to do things other than just try and make more and more money. This is actually what a lot of the, the research in, in the happiness uh, science suggests. Uh, I think the the and, and 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 you know ultimately a lot of what positive psychology says to people is also in line with that. It says you know stop just comparing yourself to everyone else. Stop trying to um, focus on yourself. Try to notice other people and notice the world around you and think about other people. And you know who, who can be against all of that? I think that um, the 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 problem is that once you start to to measure things and and you start to quantify um, happiness, then of course then it can also be be put to other other uses and there will always be those um who uh look to some of that that research to to try and think about well in that case we need to um you know build in an analysis of things like social relationships and non-market goods into our sales strategy or into our uh, employee relations strategy or this sort of thing um and i think that you know the where you take a more um, self-centered or a more um, a slightly more cutthroat approach to some of that research, um, you know, for instance, you know, there's all this research showing that if your if your friends are unhappy, you're more likely to be unhappy. Um, it's called emotional contagion. It was it was partly what Facebook were trying to test when they did their their emotional contagion study, in, uh, which was published last year, where they were manipulating people's. Uh, news feeds to see if they could spread kind of um, emotions in, uh, across different social networks. Um, but ultimately, if you were, you know, purely focused on your on yourself and on your career or, or, or your your entrepreneurial ventures, well, you might read lots of this literature and think, well, I've got to basically start cutting certain people out of my life because they're spreading bad vibes, and I've got to um, do that in order to be happier because. Uh, there's research showing that being happier is going to make me uh, work harder and sleep better and uh, uh, make more money. And so I think uh, there are not all of it, but there, there are there are areas of this of this agenda which are, um, lend themselves to quite a, um, a, 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 a an, an egotistical, um, uh, highly competitive ethos. 
where effectively it's not it, it's a it's a kind of a, almost a hoarding of happiness as it can often be or a, and a hoarding of money whereas that is often entangled with with these rather more kind of altruistic and generous um uh, approaches so, which many of which are, are manifest in things like positive psychology but um it's you know it's there's some good and some bad yeah you're right i mean I, you see that a lot um amongst like personal development blogs there's tons of them tons of books about mm -hmm. that and they yeah. they offer these great bits of advice like hang out with your friends you need to get outside more you need to exercise you need to meditate drink water and it's always and it, it always ends like so you can like make more money yeah and and i don't know there's there's some there's a part of me that i guess i'm a romantic mm -hmm. um and i like to have something like a greater good like a i, I mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't want it just to be about money, but it seems like that's what it's all about now. Yeah. I also think data, you know, I mean, there's something very pernicious about data at the moment. We, everything, is, everything is quantified and everything is data. And it's, I mean, I don't doubt that it's true, for instance, that um, spending time with near foliage is good for you. I mean, this is, this is what happiness scientists have shown. People do studies, there, there, there are studies showing that um, the color green has a positive effect on our brains and you know this is why it's good to be near trees and we should be outside and all this sort of stuff but I think it removes part of the pleasure of going for a walk in a forest if you're if, if you've got all of that in the back of your yeah. mind <laughs> like it's or, or and, and it certainly removes the pleasure if you're going for that walk in the forest in order to somehow kind of make some investment in your in your brain or your body um, and you know imagine if you were if you were going for a nice walk with, with someone else in, in that situation and you discovered that they were only there because um, they, they'd read that it was going to somehow make them um, more productive the next day or something like that, I think you'd, you'd, feel, you'd feel pretty disappointed. Yeah. And I also think the, the emphasis on happiness, it, it, uh, it, it for forces us to, f we, we miss out on like the whole human experience. Like there are benefits to sometimes feeling angry. There are yeah. benefits of sometimes feeling in a low mood and depressed, um, but happiness. I will know that don't don't do that. That is bad. You should not feel that way. Yeah. Um, but well, I think. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, I think but this is this is partly. I mean, go back to Jeremy Bentham. I mean, the the requirement of happiness science is always that things can be placed on a scale. That's that that things have to go between. I mean, the, the nature of the scale varies. Sometimes it's zero to ten. Sometimes it's minus five to plus five. But it has to you have to put numbers on things rather than attach different words to them. So, I mean, you've, you've just mentioned two different words, angry and depressed. Well, for a happiness scientist, uh, depressed would have to be a minus five and angry would have to be like a minus two or something. You wouldn't be able to see them as, as, as two separate types of things. But I, mean, I often think that one of the one of the most problematic terms that we have, I think, from, a, from, from the perspective of happiness science is when you say I was moved by something, imagine, you know, when you're moved um, by whatever it might be, a, a family experience or going to the theatre or something. What, you know, where the hell is that in the, when we say that, what are we referring to? Because often we cry, often we feel sad, often we, but you still feel happy and sad at the same time. And yeah. it doesn't really fit with anything, it, the, 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 it doesn't sort of fit on any scale. And yet, in a way, that's what makes us feel most alive. And I think that um, in a way that, you have to respect the the, the the capacities of human beings to use language in ways that make sense, but don't necessarily uh, aren't necessarily reducible to scientific metrics. Yeah, yeah. The, as I was reading your book, the the thing that came kept coming back to my mind was Brave New World. Mm. Right. That was that was I feel like what, what's going on in a, in a very soft sort of way. Uh, in fact, I, I just got done talking to a, a psychologist who specializes in humor research. And right. he was discussing how uh, big pharma is now tickling mice um, right. to figure out the benefits of laughing yeah. on on mammalian brains in order to develop a pill that can you take it you will feel happy. I mean, it's like soma, um, like real life soma, and that to me is somewhat troubling. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think one key part of this, we, which we haven't touched on, is um, antidepressants, which of mm -hmm. course. Um, I argue in the book that, in a way, antidepressants transform the whole notion of happiness and the whole notion of unhappiness in ways that I think reach far further than just the, the you know the the, the, psych, the psychiatry or the pharmaceutical industry or those who happen to take pills. Because in a way, when antidepressants were were discovered in the late 1950s, they weren't kind of properly commercialized until the 1980s. But when they were discovered, it completely changed how 
initially scientists, but later cult, more, more culturally, more generally, uh, people would conceive of things like mood because the idea that mood is something that is rooted in your in your physical being would have been pretty wouldn't have really made a lot of sense until antidepressants were discovered at that time i mean there were psychiatrists who argued this but they were pretty marginal um and i think um the idea that it's possible to change our feelings by changing our our bodies or in particular our brains um is partly a, a symptom of a, of a of a of a culture in which antidepressants have have become um, so pervasive, or at least so so culturally significant. Um, that's not to say that mood doesn't have physical dimensions to it. Clearly, it does. I mean, I'm not I'm not denying whole bodies of of, of research, but I think um, I think one of the one of the again, it's important to distinguish between something which is a symptom uh, from something which is a broader cause or the broader meaning of a term. Um, so depression has certain symptoms such as kind of you know, inability to sleep or um, uh, inability to, um, uh, or, or sleeping too much or whatever it might be. Um, and often what happens with um, the medical approach to these things is that it starts to focus. They start to focus too much on on particular physical symptoms, um, and the whole question of, of of how someone came to feel in a certain way starts to drop out of out of the equation. And in terms of your your example of of, of tickling mice, um, one of the I think one of the the most troubling uh, areas in all of this, which comes out of neuroscience again and areas of of neuroeconomics and this sort of thing, is you get research which shows that the very act of smiling has triggers certain uh, neurological um, activities which make you feel better. So that some of the um, sort of gurus of neuroscience, I'm not necessarily talking about the, 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 the people who are doing the, the, the research in, in universities and, and elsewhere, but some of the, the, the people who turn it into the positive thinking mantras and the, the business books and so on will say, well, in that case, you've got to just exercise your mouth. You've got to turn the corners of your mouth up a certain times a day. It's like a sort of exercise, like, um, like you know, uh, doing yoga or going to the gym or something, because this way you're going to keep the, sort of the right chemicals um, flowing around your brain. Now, again, I mean, I, I, don't question that the, I don't question the science. I'm not qualified to do so. But I think we have to question what that means culturally uh, if people are being encouraged to do what effectively is an is a, is a, is a, is a insincere act purely with a view to try and look after their uh, serotonin levels or, or whatever it might be or, or their career. So happiness fascism. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I say I it's not a term that I use, but um, yeah. but I, I mean the, the 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 I mean various people have, have pointed out the the um, echoes of, of Brave New World, and I think that you know I think the the problem is it's not that this stuff doesn't work. I think just like in Brave New World, it's the it's possibly the problem is that it that it works too well, and 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 what do we lose in the process? So this all uh, you know leads to the question like what do we do with this, right? Um, so we have this uh, research, we have this technology. I mean, it seems like you've been hinting that there there possibly is a role for it in our life, but how do we figure out that balance? Mm. It's very difficult, and I think that a lot of the the trends are, 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 are pulling us further in this direction, particularly with technology at the moment. I think the sorts of things that I I think would would be um, provide an alternative in the future, although I'm not uh, holding my breath that this is going to happen anytime soon is to start to try and bring back in a kind of institutional logic. So to return to my example of, of, of schools from earlier, um, think, look at some of the, the evidence on, on, on depression and anxiety and, and stress amongst young people and think about how you would um, design and run schools differently uh, in ways that allowed people to flourish because after all I'm, I mean I'm not in the book I'm not against happiness I'm not against flourishing I think in a way we need to get back to some of the early more idealistic um, era of, of, of the happiness um, uh, science or happiness agenda in a way um, but ultimately we pe what people need to be to be happy in a in a in a in a more authentic sense or in a, in a less um, kind of manipulated sense is to um, stop looking into themselves, stop seeing all the sources of their feelings as somehow internal to themselves. So I think that actually um, we need to um, stop 
blaming our own brains, our own selves, or whatever it might be for the way we feel. Um, and in a way, we need kind of less science if we, if, if that's possible. I mean, I don't think it's, it's difficult to imagine, but less less science of the brain or of the self or of behavior or of the feelings, and more. Uh, uh, experiments, I suppose, in different ways of living, uh, different ways of running institutions, which might allow people uh, to be to, to 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 spend less time worrying about themselves, less less time comparing themselves to other people. Which, after all, is what a lot of positive psychology also suggests. I think ultimately there are deep lying philosophical contradictions in the happiness agenda. I think that once you reach the point where a scientist or a manager or, or, a, or, a, or a market researcher claims to know how someone else is feeling without that person even being consulted in any way, purely on a, on a, um, on a kind of, um, you know, purely sort of quantitative scientific sense, I think that they're beginning to miss something about that person. I think this, 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 this sort of, re- a certain type of rebellion against that kind of big data, uh, high surveillance behavior, behaviorism, uh, will happen at some point. Exactly how it manifests itself, I think, remains to be seen. Interesting. Well, Will Davies, where can people learn more about your work? Well, I have a blog at potlatch.org.uk. Um, I uh, am on Twitter at Davis underscore Will. Um, and you can read my book, The Happiness Industry. Right, Will Davies, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Great. Thank you very much. My guest today was William Davies. He's the author of the book, The Happiness Industry, How the Government and Big Business Sold Us Well-Being. And you can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere.